so I've hinted and I've hinted and I've dropped preview videos about the upcoming release of the documentary I made, Lady Wrestler, that traces the history of black women in professional wrestling back to the 1950s. I interviewed wrestling legends, Ethel Johnson, Ramona Isbell and Ethel Brown. So you hear about their experiences and their story straight from their own mouths. And I've dropped clues and now it is finally here. So next Saturday, November 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern time during a live stream here on YouTube, I am going to finally announce the official release date of Lady Wrestler and give you details about how you can order it. And I will give you a little bit of background about the making of the documentary and what it was like interviewing these amazing women. Now, the reason why I'm not doing the live stream today with this video is because the I wanted to get past the madness of the election and Halloween was over the weekend. And I didn't want the announcement to get lost in the shuffle of everything that's going on in the news right now. So hopefully next Saturday, the dust will have settled somewhat. And during the live stream, you can ask me anything you want about the making of the documentary, about the history of these women and the history of wrestling and why this story has been underground for so many decades. Now, keep in mind, I'm not a wrestling scholar. I'm not a sports commentator. I'm not an expert in any way, shape or fashion on wrestling or any other sport. But I did uncover quite a few interesting facts about these women and about the history of wrestling while making this documentary. So you can either ask me questions in the comment section of the live stream on YouTube or you can email me questions ahead of time at ladywrestlermovie at gmail.com. And oh, forgot to mention, a bonus of the live stream is I will reveal the new movie poster for Lady Wrestler that I had a graphic designer create. So I'm really excited about that and excited to share that with you. While we are waiting on the live stream next Saturday, I wanted to share with you in this video the um, lecture I did exactly a year ago in late October at Otterbein University here in Columbus, Ohio, which was the birthplace of women's wrestling back in the 1930s. I've put bits and pieces of this lecture on my YouTube channel here and on my other social media platforms, but this is the lecture in its entirety, which will give you some context about the women and some background and hopefully, uh, you know, help you generate some questions to ask me next week about the release of the documentary. So. Hope you're doing well, staying safe in this COVID environment. And I look forward to seeing you next Saturday. Again, Saturday, November 7th at 2 p.m. Live stream on YouTube. Hope to see you then. Good afternoon, everyone. I love the energy. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> it's, it's Friday Eve. It's time to be excited. You know, it's almost the end of the work in school weeks. Yeah. So, my name is James Price Sock. I am the director of the Office of Social Justice and Activism. You could think of it as a diversity and inclusion office here at Otterbein's campus. One of the series that we love doing every year is the Under the Light series, and this is the last one for this semester. We will be rolling out a couple more next semester. Uh, so, those of you that are interested in the material or just like it because it's great to meet one of your class requirements, that's cool too. <laughs> We appreciate you nonetheless. Uh, so we'll be having some more next semester on different topics than we had uh, this semester. So today we are previewing um, a documentary, Lady Wrestler, and we are fortunate enough to have the director and producer of the documentary with us today, Chris Bournet. Uh, he is the director and producer of the documentary. Uh, and this uh, is some of the untold stories about African-American women in wrestling, in the ring. Uh, Chris is also a journalist, author, and filmmaker based right here in Columbus, Ohio, where many of the wrestlers trained during their, the sports golden age in the 1930s all the way through the 1960s. Brene is the co-author with Raymond Lambert of the acclaimed nonfiction book, All Jokes Aside. Uh, Stand-up comedy is a funny business. Uh, the book offers a backstage look into Lambert's successes, failures, and lessons learned running the legendary Chicago Comedy Club. Uh, all jokes aside is the name of the comedy club. And so that was really prominent in the 90s. So you had a lot of people coming out of the star factory. So we're talking about uh, Jamie Foxx, Chris Rock, Steve Harvey, Monique, D.L. Hughley, Bernie Mac, Carlos uh, Mencia, Dave Chappelle, and many others that matriculated through this factory. Uh, so that's another interesting thing. Maybe we have to have you come on campus to talk about that too one day. Yeah. 
Uh, Bournet is also the author of the novel The Chloe Chronicles, which invites readers along on the globe-hopping adventures of an exotically beautiful multiracial young woman named Chloe uh, Barreau. He is currently working on a new updated edition of The Chloe Chronicles. Uh, he also wrote and directed the dramatic play The Springtime of Our Lives, which debuted at the Columbus Performing Arts Center in October of 2013 and played Cleveland's Playhouse Square in June of 2014. So a lot going on, and somehow you still took some time out to talk to us today, so we appreciate that. What I'm going to do is pass around this sign-in sheet. Here, I'd like everyone to sign up. One, it's good because it proves that you were here. So if your teacher is needing any proof that you were here, I'll be able to show them that. But also, it enables you to be entered into a raffle to win one of these ESPN 30 for 30 sets. There's over 100 uh, documentaries between all of the DVDs. You get the poster, the beanie, the t-shirt, a director's version, and all of that. Uh, so that's um, a pretty cool gift. And so I'll be announcing that since this is our last one. You should know but definitely before the end of the semester and you could come to the Student Affairs Office and pick it up. Uh, so really appreciate you all be, being here today. Uh, so without further, further ado, please give a warm welcome to Chris Bournet. Thank you, James, again for inviting me. Yeah, and I, I, didn't, I didn't intentionally position myself back there so I could make an entrance. I was back there, actually back there talking to my friend Christopher, who's an Otterbein alum. So, Thank you all for, uh, for having me here today. So I actually want to start off with a little bit of trivia. And I have a prize. This is not a raffle. This is just a, a jump rope since it's the theme of the, uh, the day today. So who can name a movie in which a female athlete is the main central character? Just any movie, the first hand that I see that you have a correct answer, you win the jump rope. Yeah. Awesome. That was actually one of the ones that I was thinking of. What's your name? Emma. Emma. Thank you. So here's, here's a few other ones. Uh, there was a movie last year on Netflix called uh, First Match um, about a black female wrestler. Um, who's heard of the movie Girl Fight? Okay, so does, does anyone know uh, Michelle Rodriguez? Yeah. What, do you, what do you know her from? Who's Jane Wren? You're thinking of Rosario Dawson. Just kidding. <laughs> So Michelle Rodriguez has been in um, the, um, the Fast and the Furious movies, and her like breakout role was this movie called Girl Fight in 2000, where she played a, a female boxer. Um, there was Million Dollar Baby, Hilary Swank won an Oscar for that. Um, so another movie, um, so Sanaa Lathan was in this. Uh, does anyone know the movie I'm referring to that came out around, I know this is a little bit, um, maybe a little bit before you guys' time, but it came out in 2000, starred Sanaa Lathan. You're nodding. Love and basketball. Love and basketball, where Sanaa Latham played a, a basketball player. And one of, the most fe one of the most famous, rather, movies about female athletes is um, a movie called A League of Their Own. Anybody familiar with that? Anybody want to give a little bit about A League of Their Own? There's no crime in baseball. Exactly. That was the famous line by Tom Hanks. So League of Their Own is about a women's uh, baseball league during the 1940s, during the war, when a lot of the men were off fighting so the women were able to um, form their own league. So the women in this documentary, um, you know, it's kind of a courting transition, but they were in a league of their own. So this, this documentary is about black women who are world famous professional wrestlers back in the 1950s and 60s, and the vast majority of them were from Columbus. Uh, back in the, the 30s, there was a promoter named Billy Wolf, a wrestling promoter, who settled here, and he, um, he groomed his wife named Mildred Burke to be the first uh, women's world, world women's wrestling champion. And he knew that Mildred needed competitors because wrestling wasn't something that women were going, I mean sports in general was not something that women were going into, but let alone wrestling. So he started recruiting women from around the Columbus area and actually from all over the country into his wrestling business. And so Billy Wolf, he was, he was a white man, but he was inspired by Jackie Robinson. Uh, anybody familiar with Jackie Robinson and what his big claim to fame in history was? Don't everybody raise your hands at once. Anybody want to take a guess? Jackie Robinson? Yeah. First African American. Yeah, exactly. So Billy Wolf was inspired by the attention and the excitement that Jackie Robinson brought to baseball. And he thought that if he recruited black women into wrestling, that it would bring the same kind of excitement, especially because wrestling is kind of known for being kind of sensational and controversial. So in this documentary, I was able to interview two women who were um, 
famous back in the 50s and 60s, Ethel Johnson and Ramona Isbell. So what I'll show you is kind of the condensed 30 minute version of the documentary. The, the full length version is like 90 minutes, but I'll just show you this condensed version and then afterward um, I'll take any questions you may have and we can kind of discuss some of the, the themes in the documentary. So what were some, uh, some comments or questions you guys have about the, uh, the women themselves or how I put the documentary together? Did anything stand out, you know, jump out at you or? Well, while you all are thinking of your questions, I'll, I'll tell you how I came across this story. So most of my career has been in print journalism. So a friend of mine who works in uh, public relations, another African-American man, um, this was back in 2005, he, every time I would call him for story ideas, he'd say, there's this really interesting lady that I grew up with. She was some kind of wrestler or bodybuilder, and you should interview her sometime. So that turned out to be Ethel Johnson. So I sat down and interviewed her, and I just thought her story was fascinating. She had these stories about going all over the world. I mean, like, you know, everywhere from like Montreal, Canada to Cuba before the, uh, before the embargo, before Americans were banned from traveling there to, she'd wrestle in Mexico. She had a stage name in Latin America, Rita Valdez. She, uh, she and her sisters and, and all the um, women like her would go to <coughs> Japan, they'd go to Australia. And then when they would travel in the deep south because of segregation at the time, you know, they'd have to walk in the back door of restaurants, they'd have to stay in segregated hotels. I mean, the downside, you know, that was, you know, being treated like a second class citizen, but sort of a, um, fringe benefit, if you could call it that, was they met a lot of the famous athletes and entertainers of that time. So they were like, you know, they'd be sitting in the lobby of like a segregated hotel playing cards with Ike and Tina Turner. And it's like, these were their peers. They didn't think of them as like, oh, this is some, you know, legend, legend or whatever. They just thought of, you know, these are, these are people who are having to stay in this segre segregated hotel just like I am. So I wrote the story about ethical, Ethel. It was published in the Columbus Dispatch in March of 2006. So is anyone famous or familiar with the uh, the Arnold Classic? Does anyone know anyone know what that is? Can someone, someone tell me what that? Yeah, it's it's a fitness expo that Arnold Schwarzenegger holds in Columbus every March. So it's like it started out as just like a bodybuilding competition, but now they have they have wrestling, they have all different kinds of sports. So when the article came out and it was published in March intentionally because of Women's History Month, Arnold Schwarzenegger's people called me at the newspaper and they were like you know, these women, Ethel Johnson, we never knew women like her existed. We want to give her a Lifetime Achievement Award. So by this time, Ethel was a retired grandmother. She really didn't like the limelight. And she said, well, tell them I said thanks, but no thanks. So she turned down a Lifetime Achievement Award from Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I just thought, you know, her story is just too grand to be limited to, um, to you know, one newspaper article. And so also around this time, um, in, in researching the article, I came across this documentary called Lipstick and Dynamite, and it was about women wrestlers of this same era, the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but they, it was just like a passing mention of the black women. It was like, oh yeah, one of, one of the women wrestled um, uh, Babs Wingo, a black woman, and that was like the only mention of the black women, and I thought, if any women deserved their own movie, it was these women, because they were real trailblazers at a time when not only women couldn't get a mortgage or a credit card without their husband's signature at this time, I mean, African Americans in general were not going beyond the professions of like janitor, maid. I mean, there were some, you know, that were prof you know, professionals, but a lot of African Americans were, were really limited to menial jobs. And these women were going all over the world, you know, being treated like superstars. So I asked Ethel, I said, would you mind being interviewed on camera? And she said, yes. And so interestingly enough, when the dispatch article came out, Ramona Isbell, her daughter, Joan, called me and was like, you misspelled my mother's name, just so you know. And I was like, oh, well, you know, um, I'm glad you contacted me because I'm starting to work on this documentary and do you think your mom would be interested? And she was like, well, I'll ask her. So Ramona was, was very gracious in, um, in granting interviews as well. And um, does anyone want to guess where I got a lot of the footage and the, um, the archival photos from? Okay, from the blank stairs, I'll just go ahead <laughs> and tell you. So some of it was local. So some of it came from the Grandview Library. They have like a big um, archive of like, you know, old photos of the history of Columbus. And some of it actually came from the University of Notre Dame. So Jeff Lean, the, the author that I interviewed, he, he wrote this whole book about Mildred Burke, the first women's world wrestling champion. And he was like, if you're really serious about researching women's wrestling, you need to go to the University of Notre Dame. 
So I went there. I mean, they just had tons and tons of like banker's boxes of stuff that had never been open, that had been like sitting for decades. There was a wrestling promoter named Jack Pfeffer. I call him an organized pack rat because he saved everything, like press clippings, letters back and forth to him and the women. Um, so, I mean, there was just tons of stuff. So all that, I mean, that, the, the, the photos and stuff that you saw in that little 30 minute version is just like a small um, percentage of the stuff that's, that, that, that's in the University of Notre Dame archive. So it was really interesting just kind of delving into all that stuff. Have you guys had time to uh, have some questions or anything that struck you about the women of that era or the, the fact that this, you know, this phenomenon took place in Columbus and now nobody really knows about it? Yeah. You think that um, since there wasn't that many records of it, mm -hmm. she might have added a few things and made her sound a little bit better? You're talking about the women kind of pumping themselves up to. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think, if anything, they were kind of like more humble than, than what they were. Because even, I mean, there was a clip in the, in the extended version of the documentary where Ramona says Ethel was like always like the top black star. So, I mean, there were, there were dozens of women, there were dozens of black women, but Ethel really was recognized as the top black female wrestler at that time. So, you know, wrestling is all about boasting. It's just like, you know, being a rapper. I mean, you don't go out there and, you know, humbly <laughs> say, I'm gonna tear your head off. I mean, you have to have confidence to get into the, the ring in front of thousands of people. So, it, like I said, if anything, they were, they were more humble than, and the, the guy, the, um, the black guy would come out of the shoulder length curly hair, he's actually a wrestling fan in Detroit. And he, he somehow, when the Dispatch article, I think he must have read it online, he contacted me, he was like, can you um, introduce me to Ethel Johnson? I was a fan of hers back when I was a teenager, and I was like, well, I'm not going to guarantee you that she's gonna to wanna to meet you, but I'm working on this documentary, and would you be willing to talk about your, you know, your impressions as a wrestling fan? And you know, his, his impressions of Ethel was, and, the, and her sisters was like, they were really amazing. I didn't know they were sisters. They were like the Venus and Serena of their time. The Washington Post actually, um, when, I, when I had a screening of this at the Wexner Center at Ohio State, because that's where I did a lot of the, the post-production, the editing and stuff, um, the Washington Post wrote an article and they interviewed Ramona and the headline was Hidden Figures of Wrestling and that's really what they are. I don't know if any of you saw the movie Hidden Figures about the black women that were, um, that were instrumental in the, in the first moon launch, um, but you know, their story kind of faded into obscurity. And I don't think anyone would say, oh, you know, that's some story that nobody would care about. Um, these women are the same. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the reason why these women's stories are not better known is because the women themselves, then once they retired, it was kind of like, that was my old life. Uh, there was a clip in the extended version of the documentary where Ethel says, she didn't even tell her children she was a wrestler. She would just go off for a couple weeks at a time and leave them with a babysitter or whatever. And her daughter, um, her daughter Shelly tells this story where she and her friends were playing, um, you know, in front of the TV set, and one of her friends is like, isn't that your mom on TV? And it, would, it just happened to be a wrestling match was on TV. That's how she found out her mom was a wrestler. But even when her mom came home from the wrestling trip, she was like, her mom still didn't want to talk about it. And Ethel said that she didn't tell her children she was a wrestler because they, she was afraid that they wouldn't be able to like concentrate in school. They'd be worried that you know, she was gonna get beat up. Sometimes she'd come home with like her arm in a sling or whatever. And then Ramona, she kind of she kind of went into the fact that she became a born again Christian. People can be really judgmental. So I think a lot of the women, and, and plus there's this whole section about the racism that they encountered. And a lot, you know, a lot of the women, there was one woman I approached named Lula Mae Provo that I, she didn't even want to be interviewed because I think a lot of them had some really painful experiences with racism. So they didn't even want to like reopen that wound. Guys, have some more questions or yeah. How many of them got to see the So we, so I was working on this for years and years, not because it actually took years and years to finish, but you know because I had a day job and I was just kind of, you know, working on it as I had time. So I finished like a rough cut in 2012, and I had a screening for um, for Ethel and Ramona and their families at the Lincoln Theater, which I don't know if you all know is like a historic um, African American theater um, on the north uh, near east side of Columbus. So they got, they got to see it, and they were, they were very, very um, sweet and supportive. They were like, thank you for getting our story out there. Um, Ethel actually passed away in September of last year. Ramona is still alive and well. The Ohio History Connection, which is um, the History Center for Ohio, 
they actually have this big sports exhibit and they interviewed Ramona and they have um, some of her memorabilia in their, um, in their archives now. But unfortunately, a lot of the women from, you know, who were their peers have either passed away. So sh there's like chapters and chapters of, I mean, this could be like a mini series. This is just like a small um, portion of the history of these women. Um, and, I'll, and I'll share something else with you. So when I was, a lot of people, you know, they assume that the reason I made this documentary is because like I'm some kind of wrestling fanatic. Um, not only am I not a wrestling fanatic, I'm not a sports fan per se at all. I mean, I am like the most unlikely person to make a sports documentary. I was the kid who was like always picked last, you know, in recess, always uncoordinated. I remember one time in high school gym class, um, I ran the wrong way on the basketball court and got, <laughs> got hit in the head with the basketball. So people think, yo, you're a tall black male. You must be really athletic and really into sports. No, not at all. So I was sort of into wrestling when I was in middle school. That was back in the 80s when the, like, the original incarnation of the WWE was popular and um, Rowdy Roddy Piper and um, Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan were popular. So I used to watch that on um, cable TV and I was kind of into it. Then when I got to high school, I kind of outgrew it. So. I mean, as an adult, I was not into wrestling at all. I mean, I didn't, I mean, I'll watch the Buckeyes every now and then just because I went to Ohio State, but I'm not like a, a sports fan at all. So when, um, so when my friend Terry Anderson called me um, about this story, I thought, I just thought it was interesting from a historical angle. I wasn't into the, the wrestling um, aspect of it at all. So um, I realized, so when I finished the cut of this in 2017, when I finished editing it, I was like, you know what, I've never actually been to a wrestling match. I realized that all these years I was working on this wrestling documentary, I had never seen a wrestling match in person. So there's this big wrestling, wrestling event in Orlando called WrestleCon uh, every spring. So I went down to um, WrestleCon that April in 2017 because they had a big women's tournament. And I think it was good that I wasn't a wrestling fan because I was able to be objective. Sometimes when you're so close to something, it's like you can't really you know, kind of see the forest for the trees. So what really, really impressed or made an impression on me was at this big rep women's wrestling tournament, most of the fans in the audience who seemed into it were men. Um, it seemed like the men had kind of dragged their wives and girlfriends to this, and the women were kind of sitting there looking bored. And the, the men, I mean, were just going crazy, not because they were looking at the women necessarily as sex objects, but they were like, you know, into these women as like some men root for football players or whatever, and they were you know, after each match, they were running up to the women and taking selfies and high-fiving. And I actually interviewed some of the men afterward, and I was like, well, why, why would you want to come and watch women's wrestling? And they were like, oh, these women are awesome. They're really underrated. Um, they just went on and on and on singing these women's praises. And, I, you know, to me, professional wrestling is kind of looked down on as like this, you know, lowbrow. It's, you know, quote, unquote, fake. Everything is choreographed. It's looked at as like this, you know, um, lowbrow entertainment that's not real sports. But I actually think there's no other, there's no other um, sporting, whatever you want to call it, sport form of entertainment where, where men would root for women like that. I can't imagine going to a, a women's football game if such a thing existed and seeing an, you know, a stadium full of men rooting for the women and running down and wanting to take pictures with them. I can't imagine you know, when the WNBA was really popular, all the, st the stands being filled with men and, and the men wanting to like take selfies and stuff with the, the women afterwards. So, one thing that I think is kind of underrated about wrestling is that, um, now these men, would, the wrestling fans would never call themselves feminists, but they sort of have this egalitarian view of the sport of like, if you can wrestle, I'll give you respect. And I can't really think of any other sport that's like that. Some comments, questions? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, appreciate your work in the team for the first time. When I look at this, it kind of reminds me of how powerful selective history is. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of how while some people may have been celebrated at the time, history yeah. has a way of deciding what's important and what's not important. Yeah. And people's narratives and their stories get diminished for some capacity. Yeah. And it seems like some of the factors of that were maybe racism, maybe mm -hmm. because this was so uh, out of the side of the norm for women to be doing this. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, I had a couple of questions in mm -hmm. regards to that as far as the narratives go. Yeah. Is there anyone that became promoters themselves as far as the women go that tried to further this, to further this legacy? Did any of them uh, try to start schools or you know stay involved in the sports, sports somehow? Mm -hmm. And as far as those 
factors that cause some of them to be quiet and not share the story. Mm -hmm. Because there's a huge silence culture because of sin. Yeah. Because of sin. And it seems like those similar factors are taking place in this as well. Yeah, good question. So I don't think any of the black women that I know of became promoters, but some of the, most of them kind of retired and went on to second careers. Ethel, I think, just be, kind of became like a full-time mother after she retired. Ramona, as I said, she became a, I don't, I don't remember if that was in the clip or not. She became, she went to work for the Ohio Bureau of, Bureau of Workers' Compensation. Um, Marva, uh, Ethel's young, youngest sister, she actually became um, a youth counselor at this place that used to exist called Tico. It was like, um, you know, the juvenile detention center. So she would, she would um, go wrestle on the weekend. So she would kind of do it part time. Actually, Mildred Burke, she actually moved to Los Angeles after she divert, divorced Billy Wolf and she started her own wrestling promotion business. Actually, and another wrestler named Moolah, she started her own wrestling uh, business. She was from, I think I want to say South Carolina. And there was actually recently um, a Vice News um, uh, story about Moolah and how, like Billy Wolf, <coughs> Moolah was like, she empowered women, but she also exploited women. And there was, a, there was another famous black, or black female wrestler named Sweet Georgia Brown, and she was represented by Moolah. And Sweet Georgia Brown's um, adult children, were, who are biracial, were saying that we don't know what was going on with Moolah, but it was more than wrestling because our mom would go away on these wrestling trips and she would come back impregnated. And it was like, excuse my French, but it's like Moolah seemed to be pimping the women out. You know, she, so I don't know how much of that went on in the wrestling business. But so those are two examples of two of the white women who went on to be promoters. As far as I know, none of the black women started their own wrestling promotion business, but you're right about kind of history, kind of being selective. And part of it, as I said, the women themselves have been kind of secretive about it, you know, whether it was because they didn't want to talk about the painful experiences they had, or in Ramona's case, being a born again Christian. But also I think in general, you know, I don't think it can be argued that women's stories are not elevated as much as men. You don't see women's sports, even to this day, on TV as much as you see men's. You don't see, you know, with the exception of a handful, you don't really know, women athletes are not household names the way that men are. So I think it's just that um, his, historians probably thought, number one, wrestling is fake and we're not going to champion these women that were part of something that we consider fake. And then number two, women's history and black women's history is not something that society in general really champions, you know. Therefore, you have stories like hidden figures that just completely vanish into thin air until somebody decides to, you know, shine a light on it. Some more questions, comments, or? So I'll share with you, so as I was working on this over the years, so technology kept changing while I was working on this. So when I started working on it, like mini DV, which is like, you know, mini like um, cassette basically that you would record on, that was like the, the standard. And then it, it moved to like um, SD cards. So it's like I have all these like hours and hours of interviews on different formats. And some of them it's like if you play the tape, the tape will start crunching, you know, because it's just like the, the tape is so old and it's been sitting around for a while. So, you know, trying to pres preserve a lot of that stuff is kind of a challenge too. And editing on different systems, like I started, I started out editing on Final Cut, which has become obsolete. So I had to, when I started um, doing the post-production at the Wexler Center, they, they transferred it to Avid, which is like a more um, kind of advanced, sophisticated system. Um, and even Avid is sort of like, now everybody's like moving to Premiere. So that was kind of, and I, I, don't, I don't have a, I'm not a, I never went to film school. My degree's in English. So like kind of learning the technologies I went along, that was kind of a challenge. And also finding um, people to like give some context. I don't believe he was in the, um, the clip I showed you, but there's a, an Ohio State black, um, black studies professor named Hassan Jeffries. His brother, um, Hakeem, is actually a congressman. So he actually gave the historical perspective of, of how um, unique these women are. All right, well, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, James, again, for inviting me. <coughs> Appreciate it. Thank you.